Good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started here in a second. For starters, um, we're going to go over a little bit of the of the IR and NMR lab which you guys had to work on last week. Um, because let's see if I can get up, get Canvas pulled up here. Um, I think the way I was working on um, giving getting you guys a study guide ready for the final, and I think that the way that I'm going to structure it is going to be kind of similar to the midterm um, in that there'll be a portion that is timed um, that you can start at any time, probably starting Monday. You'll have any time next week from Monday to Thursday to, to take the time portion and it'll be a two hour time portion, um, just like the midterm structured a lot like that. Um, and that, but I think what I'm, I'm going to give you guys a take home portion as well that won't be timed. It'll also be due next Thursday. Um, that way I can ask you some, some lab type questions on, on some of the, the lab um, techniques um, that won't be under the time stressed environment. So it'd be something a lot like one of the packet questions. Um, so we will see about that. Um, the color looks different on these buttons than it normally does. Is, wasn't it a lighter blue before? I don't know if I changed something in the HTML or what, or Firefox updated itself or, um, anyway, it doesn't really matter that much. It still makes the point. Um, and I was looking and it looks like only five of you guys have the IR and the NMR practice done and turned in anyway. Um, so that tells me one of two things, either the packet was too long, um, or you guys are struggling with it a little bit, or even after a week of break, you're still tired and trying to catch up in all your classes. Um, any of those and all of those are probably true. Um, but that I just thought, uh, that it would be a good opportunity right now to, um, go over any of those problems that were still giving you trouble any of the NMR IR problems. Does anybody have one in particular that you got stuck on? Um, I got stuck on eight, I believe. Okay, let me get it pulled up. If we go over that one, that would be fantastic. Let's... Yes, Sean, I got stuck on eight and nine. And I think they were the same. It was like the, the dub, like one or the other, you were picking one or the other. Right. There it is. Um, and also, I used some of my time over break to, I think, work out some kinks. I think the reason you're seeing me show up twice here is because I have my tablet logged in as well. I think I found a way I can use my stylus to write on the tablet and have it show up while I'm presenting on my computer. Um, so we're going to try that. It's a little bit more complicated, but I think it'll make it so you can understand my chicken scratch a little bit better when I'm, when I'm drawing on the screen. All right. So for starters, we've got our formula C7H8O. And right off the bat with the formula and the fact that we have a five hydrogens right around seven on the NMR. That's sort of a dead giveaway that we've got a benzene ring right there. And the fact that there's five hydrogens on that benzene ring means it's only got one, one thing attached to it. So at the very least, we can start to look at it as we know we're gonna have something It's going to look like that with, and then what the rest of our 
um, formula here is we got one more carbon, three more hydrogens left, and an oxygen. All right, so that kind of limits us right off the bat to we know that both the oxygen and the carbon are only attached to the benzene ring in one spot because we had five protons on the benzene ring. So we can't have an oxygen on one spot on the benzene ring and a carbon on the other spot of the benzene ring, or we'd have a four on that integration. So then if we look at what's left, our other two options are basically we could have a carbon attached to the benzene ring with an OH on the carbon, or we could have an ether linking the two. We could have an oxygen attached to the benzene ring and a methyl attached to the oxygen. Those are really only our only two options, right? Anytime you get an integration of five around seven, that's actually really, really, that narrows things down a lot because it means a benzene ring with only one thing attached. It's not just that it's a benzene ring, it means that whatever else is in your formula is attached to the benzene ring in one place. So our options would be the ether, or the alcohol. And so between those, if we can get it narrowed down to those two options, without even looking at the IR, the NMR actually gives us all the information we need, right? Because we've got two different signals, which tells us it's gotta be an OH and a CH2. Um, and remember that the, the shielding and alcohol oxygens in general are funny in NMRs. They don't always show up at all, frankly. If we actually took our NMR data ourselves, or occasionally you can get an oxygen proton a proton attached to an oxygen that just doesn't show up with any coupling at all. It'll show up as a signal almost always, but it but the, you can't trust the splitting if it's an OH. Um, and you can't really trust the chemical shift as much either. Um, because yes, it's attached directly to an oxygen, which is electronegative, but oxygen also has all of those lone pairs around it, which just throws things off. We can, and that's why OHs, if you look at that, the charts, OH protons show up in a really wide range um, of values, just like carbon hydrogen bond, um, protons um, show up anywhere from like zero all the way up to like five. OH protons can show up anywhere from zero all the way to five as well. So don't read too much into the chemical shift or the splitting there. The fact that there are two different signals is all the information you need to decide between these last two choices. I think um, where I got kind of confused though is that I thought because um, oxygen is more electronegative than like the carbons are, then that way like the it would start the signals from going from the oxygen out. So. And and that's that's part of what I mean is that and that's one of the things that that takes a lot of practice and sort of seeing these these gone through in the getting them right to to really see it is knowing that you can't trust chemical shift which is how far left or right it is you can trust the integration but you can't trust the chemical shift and you can't trust splitting because if if the splitting was working this would show up should show up as a triplet right because it's next door to two hydrogens. So, so when you've got an OH group, especially nitrogens, I would be careful with nitrogens, but it doesn't show up nearly as often. Um, OH is in particular, you can trust the integration and that they'll show up, but you can't trust the splitting or the chemical shift as much. 
um, because resonance throws all that off because the just the electron density in general throws that off. This shouldn't be able to resonate because it's got an sp3 carbon in between the oxygen and the benzene ring, but the electron density of the benzene ring could be doing some weird thing that's shielding it a little bit more than normal. There are a lot of other variables going on and, and oxygen is where you see all the weird stuff happen um, when it comes to these NMRs. Hey, Sean, I got a question about those. Mm -hmm. um, so then if you just see that one hydrogen blip, can you usually assume that that's the hydrogen that's attached to like an oxygen, not anything that's not a carbon essentially? Unless one of your possibilities has a, a single hydrogen attached to a carbon, like if we had a tertiary carbon, oh, okay. only okay. one, in okay. that case, you'd have to be careful with it. But okay. that then usually the splitting will tell you the difference. Okay. Um, and then with the IR, the second chart, we're still not looking at any, any of the fingerprint area, correct? No, it's just okay. not worth it. If you got an NMR, it's, it's worth it to spend more time thinking about the NMR and just okay. use the IR for real broadly, because that would, even if we just got down to, to these two options, even if we can't decide between them because you guys don't have the intuition, don't have the experience with NMR yet, if we go down here and look at this, if we know our choices are an ether and an ox and an OH group, the IR makes that decision really clear for us too, right? Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So any and that's that's the other piece of those those alcohols that get confusing on the NMR is a lot of times um, the IR will clear it up and sort of well I think that this is an OH from the NMR because it's acting weird, but and then you go to the IR and say well I definitely have an oxygen somewhere. Because, or an OH somewhere because I've got this really distinct rounded big peak. And so when you put both of them together, it's, I won't say it's really obvious because it's still really tricky and there's a lot of stuff. I just have a lot of experience. It's a lot of it is knowing what order to sort of process things in. And, and that takes practice. Um, but if we're looking at what are the, you know, I, I always like to look for what are things I can look at that are dead giveaways that I can say, okay, unequivocally, I know this about the molecule because that narrows it down a lot, right? Um, so looking for benzene rings on the NMR, looking for OHs on the IR, are those are like the first two things to look for because, because those there's no question about and they're really easy to recognize pretty early on. And then the other, the other piece of it that, that takes some practice getting used to is once you have one of those options, one of those smoking gun, I know it's this, um, look, go back to your formula and say, okay, well, what do I have left? After I draw that piece that I know I have, what do I have left? Because that's what gave us, got us down to only two options right off the bat here, right? Was starting by drawing the benzene ring. And then six of our carbons and five of our hydrogens are taken care of. And that really limits what we have left. Don't just sit at the spectra, at, look at one spectra and trying to interpret it all on your own without going back and looking at your other pieces of data as well. Because the other pieces of data allow you to play that, that process of elimination game a lot faster. I like this. This I got a I got a twelve dollar stylus too. That's really really cool. It looks really weird. It's got this like little plastic thing on the end of it. That uh, that's like flexible. That goes flat, and then so I can actually see what I'm writing because those those rounded ones you never they never actually write like they're supposed to. I don't know if you guys have tried writing on a tablet with a stylus. There, it's it's pretty awful unless you get like an Apple pen, which is like one hundred and fifty dollars, or um, you just are gonna not be able to write very well. But I think I found a good solution. So if we're looking at nine, nine's the same formula, right? And nine, we've got we still got three signals in the IR, 
but five of them are still right in that benzene ring area, right? They're showing up as more than one signal, but they're all in the, the aromatic region. So despite the fact that it looks like that's two different signals there, the fact that there's five of them still in the aromatic ring tells us it's still five protons attached to a benzene ring. And this is what I mean about oxygen is where the weird stuff starts showing up too. Um, but because if we just treat that, okay, well, I've got five protons attached to a benzene ring, I'm just going to go ahead and treat those three or those five protons as just, you know, I have five protons on a benzene ring, then we get the same starting point as before. We still have a benzene ring and that has only one thing attached to it. And I'll explain why it shows up as those two rings in this case in just a second. Um, but that still means we still, the what's left is still just an oxygen and likely, and we have, not likely, we definitely only have three protons attached, right? And since we, we have one signal, that's three protons by themselves that's not in the bent in the aromatic region. That tells me that, well, I've, I've got one carbon left and three protons left. That's almost certainly going to be a methyl, right? In some form, because all three of those hydrogens have to be identical to each other. So here we're going to have the other option and like, like you caught RJ, it's you're deciding between the two options between eight and nine. And the fact the the biggest thing that allows us to tell the difference is if you look at the stuff that's not in the aromatic region. Because the stuff that's not in the aromatic region tells you, do I have one hydrogen that's that's non-aromatic, or do I have two different hydrogens that are non-aromatic? Right? Because the Example here, we had two hydrogens that were out, or two different signals that were outside of the aromatic region. So that tells us it was a CH2 and an OH. Here, we only have one hydrogen that's out of the aromatic region. So it's got to be a CH3. Um, and the, the reason these two show up as two distinct signals is, is entirely due to this oxygen and resonance in this case. Um, because the oxygen has a lone pair, which means it can resonate. Those, those one of those lone pairs on the oxygen can per, um, participate in resonance. You can have a resonance structure that looks like, so we could have a resonance structure that looks like the pi electrons here move over, and the lone pair moves down, and we would get something that looks like, with a negative charge down here. And so that's, we wouldn't expect that to be as stable, right? Because now we have formal charges, two formal charges, a positive on the oxygen and a negative on that carbon, where before everything was neutral. Um, but that everything still has a full valence at this point, at least, right? And so it's not that unstable. And, the, and if you look at it, there are three different places, three different carbons on the benzene ring where you could put the negative charge, right? You could put the negative charge at either of the two carbons that are, that are adjacent. I don't have my keyboard attached, so I can't control Z that. Hang on. Um, 
Here, I'll draw on the one at the top. So you can put a negative charge on either of the two carbons that's adjacent to where the oxygen's attached. Or you could put a negative charge here, right? Because we're going to wind up alternating where that negative charge could go. And so those three high, those three carbons are going to have more electron density than the other two carbons in the benzene ring, right? Which is exactly why we see this ratio of two to three. The three hydrogens are slightly more shielded because they have a little bit more electron density on those hydrogens. So those are the three that you can resonate the negative charge to. And the two hydrogens are the, are the carbons, are the protons attached to carbons where you can't resonate a negative charge. So that would be here and here. Those purple carbons, you can't resonate a negative charge to them. And so they have a little bit less electron density. And so they show up on the um, on the benzene ring as two different signals, but they're both still in the aromatic region. So a lot of times with the benzene rings and the NMR, look at what's in that entire region, unless you think you have more than one benzene ring, that look at that entire aromatic region and treat all of that, like all of those together is what's attached to the benzene ring. Um, when you get a little bit more advanced, you can start to see things like, okay, well, um, or if you have really high resolution NMR, you can tell the difference between some of these or explain why it shows up as two signals instead of one or instead of three. Um, but it's really at this level for right now, the main point of the aromatic region is, okay, how many things do I have attached to my benzene ring? because benzene, pure benzene is just six hydrogens, right? Attached to it. So you have five hydrogens in the aromatic region. That means you've got one thing attached to a benzene ring. If you have four hydrogens attached in the aromatic region, you have two things attached to your benzene ring. Because every time you attach something to your benzene ring, you're taking away a proton, right? So it's a little bit like degrees of unsaturation. And that what's missing tells you what, what possibilities you have. And how did the rest of these go? Any, any questions on this before I clear? Feeling it's one of those where, oh, it's, it's obvious when Sean does it. It's still not obvious. That's fair enough. Um, and, and I will reiterate that when I was learning this the first time too, I felt like there are so many possibilities and I'm just making stuff up. Um, that's, and that's what you are doing. Just remember you're justifying it by what the, by what the evidence shows. And the evidence is where, where are your peaks? What is the integration? How does it match with the molecular formula? If that's, that's your safety net is okay. There are only so many ways I can arrange these atoms that I have. That's that's why that's one of the first things we learned how to do in OCHEM was draw all the possible isomers, right? And then we start eliminating them as we go through and look at the spectra. This, you don't have to start from nothing with the spectra. You might be able to when you get good at it, but for now, it's all about draw your possibilities and just slowly start crossing them out. And if you get to the point um, where you can't decide with two, between two possibilities, it's, it wouldn't be a full credit answer if there was a better way, if there was a way to, to decide between the two, but that's a, you know, an eight out of 10 answer. It's like, well, I got it down to these two possibilities and now I can't decide. Um, if you guess right, but justify it the wrong way, then it's still going to be an eight out of 10. So there's there's no penalty necessarily. If you really can't decide between the two possibilities and you're just going to take a 50-50 shot and guess, you still have to justify your answer, right? And if you don't justify your answer properly, I'm still going to give you that eight out of 10 as though you left it at that at two. So when you get to the point where you're down to just two, 
of course I want you to try and get it right, but there's no problem with, I got it here and I really don't see what the logic is that will let me get to the last one. That's acceptable if less than ideal. All right, so what did 10 look like? And then the other piece that really, that helped a lot, a lot here is we definitely don't have an OH group on the ion. Um, and especially considering that the IR is a lot simpler to interpret, it looks more complicated, frankly, right? But there's a lot less to an IR. It's a lot easier to see what's going on. You either have something or you don't. There's no splitting or integration or any of that. Um, so use your IR as your safety blanket too. Like, you know, if you get down to your two options and you're staring at the NMR and you feel like you're beating your head against the wall, go back to the IR and see if there was anything, what's different about your two options. And can the IR allow you to pick between those two? Um, and in this case, the IR would definitely help us, even if we couldn't see it ourselves. We're missing that OH group, the big broad stretch here. And instead, we've got a bunch of carbon hydrogen bonds. Um, we don't really have anything that looks like in um, a carbonyl. We have this big sharp peak right here at 1600, but that's a little bit low. That's probably a benzene ring. But again, benzene rings are really hard to identify in the IR, but you could use that as supporting information. Like I've got all these protons in the aromatic region, the NMR, plus I've got a peak at 1600 in the IR. Put those together, I, that, that 1600 peak is probably the benzene ring. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the other thing with the, with the formula is that we knew we didn't have to worry about any carbon oxygen double bonds because if you look at your degrees of unsaturation here there's so if it was saturated be c7h16 right 2n plus 2 where n is your carbons and so we're missing, if it should be, if it was saturated be H16, we're missing four pairs of hydrogens, which means we can have up to four pi bonds or four rings. The sum of the pi bonds and the rings has to add up to four because they have four pairs of hydrogens missing. And a benzene ring has three pi bonds and one ring. So that uses up all of our degrees of unsaturation. So despite the fact we have an oxygen here, we can't have a carbonyl because we don't have enough hydrogen. We have too many hydrogens for there to be a carbonyl. If, we, if it was C7H6O, we might have a carbonyl there because then we'd be missing five pairs of electrons. And if it's C7H6O, we don't even need the spectra. There's only really one option. What's the one possibility we could have with C7H6O? Just a benzene with a carbonyl? A benzene with a carbonyl attached. Right, because we'd have five of our hydrogens would be around the benzene ring. Our sixth hydrogen is right here. Six of our carbons are in the benzene ring. The seventh one is right here. And there's our oxygen. If there, I don't think that there's another way to draw C7H6O. I think that's the only real possible structure just based on the pure formula. All right, so. 
that formula and the degrees of unsaturation can eliminate things a lot more than you think, especially if you've got a benzene ring, because the benzene ring is really going to narrow things down a lot. All right, what did 10 look like? Anybody get, did you guys get stuck on eight and nine and stop or did you guys manage to get to 10? Yeah, I got to 10. I got a little bit of hung up on it though. Yeah, the degrees of unsaturation work a little different when there's a nitrogen, right? Because the nitrogen actually brings one extra hydrogen to the table um, compared to an oxygen. Uh, but it's still, we can still look at this and say, well, it's definitely a benzene ring, five protons. So we know that that's six of our carbons and five of our hydrogens right there. And then one hydrogen, two hydrogens, three hydrogens. We can probably work it out just from the integration. Um, but we might want to end the splitting. If we do still have a, a couple of possibilities here. So. We know we have that for sure. Then we could have one, we have something with only one hydrogen attached to it, and then two hydrogens and three hydrogens. So it could look like That that probably makes the most sense. Other than the splitting, splitting doesn't agree with that one, does it? Because that would look like our, wherever our single proton is should have more nearest neighbors than our two hydrogens. So probably switch the CH2 and the nitrogen would make more sense. Right, because then the nitrogen, the hydrogen attached to the nit nitrogen behaves about like we would expect. It's not as weird as oxygen is. So we would expect the hydrogen that's on the nitrogen to be the most de-shielded. Plus, we would expect the nitrogen to have an integration of one anyway, unless it's at the end of a carbon chain. So, and that would give us the, the splitting is a little bit hard to see all the details, but we can, at the very least, we might not be able to look at the, the amine proton and see all of the splitting. We can definitely see it's got more splitting than anything else though, right? And those, when you get above a quartet, it gets really hard, it gets really easy to miss um, the little tiny peaks that are at the bottom. Because remember those bell curve looking shapes when we start drawing the splitting, those ones on the side are really small. Those last two on the outside be, are really easy to get lost in the noise, especially when we have something that's as, as pixelated as this, it's not very high resolution. So we're probably just not seeing these tiny splits on the side, but either way, 
we can tell that it's way more splitting than anything else. And the other two splitting patterns match up with this, right? We've got CH2 with no, with, this, is, this would be with no nearest neighbors. So that still doesn't quite match. Um, but it matches qualitatively in the sense that the one that has the most splitting is the single proton that's the most de-shielded. And we know we can't have, we don't need to worry about switching CH2 and CH3. The CH3 has to be at the end, right? So there's not, I don't need to worry about, well, what if the CH3 was over here? That doesn't make any sense. That'd be a carbon with five bonds, right? So putting the one, the car, the proton with the integration of one and the most splitting, even if we can't see all the details we would like. And, and that's really, a lot of times, that's the way to approach the splitting is use the splitting as a supporting argument rather than your primary argument. It, um, especially if, because you know you can trust the splitting when it's carbon-carbon bonds. When carbon nitrogen, carbon oxygen is involved, splitting gets funky. Um, but if it was CH2 next to the CH3, we would be able to trust that the CH2 should show up with, with an integration of at least four, because it should couple with the other hydrogens on the methyl. So we should see four peaks, or a quartet rather, not four peaks. Right. But again, if you got down to those two options and justified your answer, as best you can. And I'm trying to think of what, it might be a Sherlock Holmes quote, when you've eliminated, when you've eliminated all of the things that are impossible, whatever's left must be right, regardless of how improbable it seems, or if it seems like you're making it up. If you have a list of options and you eliminate all but one of those options, even if it feels like you're making stuff up, you've eliminated every other chance. So it's gotta be right even if it feels like you're making it up. I am now that's gonna bother me. I think it might be from the BBC Sherlock with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. And I'm gonna use my break to figure that out. Hey, All sorry. right. Yeah. About that. Is it so for some of them, was it wrong? I just drew like I caught the rings and then I drew out the possibilities of what I thought it could be and then just started like ticking off which ones made sense with the high That's, high that's that, exactly the way to do it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that's sometimes it's really straightforward off the top that there's only one or two options. Sometimes there's more options. And then that's when you have to go back and forth and say, okay. And but trust yourself for the most part, if, you're, if you go through and you have to go through some convoluted logic that's really foreign to you to cross off one of your options. And then when you go back before you circle your final answer and you're like, wait a second, how did I do that one? One, that's why it's a good reason to write it out as you're doing it, your, what your logic is. Um, so you can remind yourself, but two, trust yourself as well. If you cross it off, it's because it made sense at some point. So like, don't go back and try to redo everything necessarily, unless you think you found a mistake. If you wound up crossing all of your possibilities off, then you made a mistake somewhere. And that's when you might go back and double check it. Um, and really, like I said, take, you know, keep a note, keep notes while you're doing it. And when you get down to the one correct structure, you should be able to assign each of the peaks in the NMR to one of the, the different sources of hydrogens, right? And, and that's your final proof. Like, okay, out of all the options, this one makes the most sense because I crossed everything else off. And now I can go through and assign everything that's left. All right, so this will be the, I'm not sure if I'm gonna call it the a um, lab, final. Um, and I believe, I, so I think all of the labs are going into the same assignments category. Um, there's a question about dropping one lab. Um, I 
believe that they're all of your assignments are going into the same category. We don't have labs called out separately and you get to drop one assignment. Um, so if you've been doing all the, I mean, not like we've had a whole ton of homework assignments, most of your homework has been labs. Um, but if, you were, if you've been doing all those, then, then um, you, sh you do still have one to give prob probably. And I'll try to have those grades all up, caught up completely um, by, tomorrow night, if not later today, depending on how my day goes today. I have a lot to do this week too, just like you guys, um, keeping track of all my stuff and grading's not even on my to-do list. Um, so I have to get all your take-homes written by Thursday so I can give them to you guys and the Gen Chem students and everything. Um, but I won't leave you in the dark on the grades uh, any longer than I have to. All right, any, as far as the take home goes, this is related. So um, the take home is basically going to be something like one of these problems. So I'll try and find a better quality NMR with a little higher resolution. Um, and I'll probably find a couple different versions and sort of, and you'll get randomly assigned one of the, one of the different versions. Um, so it'll be a couple different compounds floating around. So I'll give you an NMR and an IR. Um, I might even give you GC data. Um, so well, that'll be a, a little bit of a throwback. Um, that I give you GC data, an NMR and an IR, um, and maybe some, some experimental information like it boiled at this temperature or you distilled it and collected it at this temperature um, and have you guys go through um, and I'm thinking I'm probably not going to give you the formula directly, but I'm going to give you like mass percentages. So it's 28% carbon by mass and 12% hydrogen by mass. So yeah, I might have to do a little bit of review of Gen Chem. How do I get from per mass percentages to a formula? And remember, and the easiest way was just assume you have 100 grams of it and then use that to figure out how many moles of everything you have and figure out what those mole ratios are. So I'll make you do a little bit of reviewing. It won't be straight up just giving you something like one of these problems. I'll give you a little bit more to it, um, but it's gonna be about like that. I'm not gonna go too overboard on the take home portion. And I'll give that to you by Thursday night um, at the latest. And then on Thursday, I have, so I have a study guide for you as well that I will post here in a few minutes. Um, and the study guide has the lab stuff as well as the, um, this is still all set the way it's set up from, from last, last year when it was closed book. Um, but it's gonna be open book for you guys, but it's got a list of practice problems and what are what I thought were the biggest concepts from each of the chapters that we've gone over. Um, since the since the midterm. It's gonna focus on stuff since the midterm, but I still expect you know how to um, count to four, but not five. Right, so all the stuff from first half of the quarter is still fair game, but I'm gonna focus on the second half. Um, and these are the types of questions I would ask on the timed portion. So rather than give you an NMR and an IR and have you go from scratch, I might say, okay, here's a compound really, you know, really qualitatively, what would the NMR look like? And so you say, okay, well, these are going to be the most de-shielded. It's going to have an integration of three. It's going to have this, this amount of splitting and sort of just give me a really rough idea. Okay, these are what the three signals would look like. And these are the order it would be in. Right? And, so, and like I said, there's a lot of practice problems in the book from these. Um, and we can go over them on Thursday, assuming we have time after everybody's research projects. Um, but if we don't have time on Thursday, we can go over some of these in office hours on Friday, um, or I don't mind on our week of finals week, we don't have anything scheduled on Tuesday, 
um, but I don't mind using our regular lecture time slot as a review session um, during finals week if we don't get to it during, uh, during Thursday. All right, any, any questions on scheduling, logistics? You haven't looked at the study guide very long, so you don't have, have probably don't have uh, any questions about the test yet, but I'll get that out there to you today so you can think about it before Thursday. So Sean, um, yeah. when you're doing the evaluations of the presentations, I don't have a printer, so I can't print out the rubric. Are we just like, do you, or should I figure out how to get the rubric printed out? LD, if you need, I'll print out the rubric for you. Oh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I think that the rubric is is more for for me than you guys. You guys have to. I'm I'm basically going to be grading your. You don't have to fill this out for everybody. Oh, I thought that's what we were doing. No, what? How I'm going to grade your peer evaluations is basically you're going to have to um, submit just like a word document, basically, um, that you don't have to fill this out. I want you to have one intelligent question about everybody's presentation. That's, that's a good life skill in general for research presentations is either beforehand or over the course of their presentation, you should be able to come up with one intelligent question. Um, and that, that always prevents that awkward dead space at the end of a presentation where they say any questions and nobody raises their hands. Um, and if you're ever emceeing at something like that, if you're ever the one introducing the speaker, you always need to keep one in your back pocket so that when you do get that dead space at the end, if nobody else speaks up, you can be the one like, I actually had a question about. Um, so practice that, that's how I'm going to grade you and determine whether or not you read everybody else's papers and paid attention is, did you ask a good question or not? And so, so it not, it's, not going to be verbal though you want us just to submit it on a word document no so i'm going to give you everybody the chance to ask their question if they okay. if they feel comfortable doing that but if you if we run out of time or you don't feel comfortable um asking in front of everybody then then that's the way i can still judge whether or not you you were paying attention and or read the paper is by you submitting it so you'll have the option though to ask it it's just sometimes people have really good presentations and everybody wants to ask a question at the end and we won't have time for that necessarily. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, so I will be filling this out for everybody. You're just, you guys just keep a, a Word doc of what are your, or you know, handwritten, I don't care. You guys know how to submit stuff. Um, and you'll just be submitting your questions for everybody else's along with your presentation. Um, so, and I will make sure that I get the assignment. So you don't have to turn it in today, but by the end of the week, I want everybody's, um, you know, your PowerPoint presentation or whatever you're using to do your presentation, as well as your, doc, your list of questions submitted to the, um, to the assignment on Canvas, and I'll make sure that that shows up on Canvas. Um, are, will you make it so we can upload multiple documents? Because I know sometimes it only lets us upload one document at a time. I don't know that that's an option on my end. That might be a software issue, depending on if you're uploading from an iPhone or, or something. So you might have to, but I will make it so you can do multiple submissions. So if it won't let you submit, attach both files to the same assignment, um, submit it, and then go to resubmit and submit your other file. Oh, and you can see what we've past submitted, even if we can't see it. Because I know when I resubmit stuff, it just looks like it erases the first thing that I submitted. Yeah, let me see if I can find something that somebody had more than one submission, and I can show you what it what it looks like but yeah basically i can i can have a drop down menu it says and it always shows me your, whatever you submitted last is what i see by default but i can see all of your submissions 
Um, so that's um, always an option for submitting multiple files. If you can't do it, do it the other way. Any other questions along the, those lines? Sean, I have a question about the question. Yeah. Say that, I mean, what if you really don't have a question, but you understand the article really well? Can you like just say like, oh, this was interesting and I thought that was cool or like something like that or I don't I, know. I would, you could do that. I would try to almost always in the paper, if, the, if the, you understand the paper really well, almost always at the end, there's going to be a little blurb about further research or this is where we would go from there or these are the outstanding questions. Um, if you can't come up with a question just based on how they how they wrote it um, originally, you can at least look at that and say, okay, well, you know, use your imagination a little bit. Use like the practice we've been doing from the quizzes. Like, um, oh, that's an interesting idea. I hadn't thought about going in that direction. Does that mean we could also go this direction with it? So it can be about future research. If you think the article is really easy, not easy to understand, but if you think the article is well read, um, well written, and you read it really well, and you don't have questions about the research, your question can be about where do you go from there? What other doors does it open up? Okay. Um, and that also is, is usually true for actual research presentations when you guys go to grad school or um, upper division classes and are taking, seeing a lot of these presentations like you guys are going to be giving. Um, the stuff that's published is usually about a year out of date by the time it actually hits print. Um, so odds are, if you're the one actually doing the research and writing the articles, um, you actually have some of those other questions already answered, you just haven't published it yet. Um, and so it's um, a good, you know, looking at that future research section is usually a good way to see what questions the researchers still have. And if the researchers still have questions, then that kind of gives you a good direction to go on for your questions. Um, and which is, and it's also just kind of how research works in general. It seems like if you go into grad school into the research, research seems like you should be like, oh, this is my project. This is what I'm working on. This is what I'm being paid to do from my grant funding. Um, but there's always the expectation that on the side you have other projects going along that are supporting writing new grants um, that are answering questions that weren't in your original grant application or in your last article you always have to have more than one iron and fire because you can't just be super narrow because then if you get to the end of your grant funding and you haven't answered your question and you haven't finished writing your phd yet then you're out of funding and you don't have any money left if you weren't supporting you're, and that's how you support the people coming after you in grad school as well, is they get some money from some of your grants for a few years while they figure out what their research project's going to be and write their own grant proposals. Um, so it's always an ongoing thing. There's always a lot of stuff going on, which is one of the reasons why it's so hard to keep up in grad school and why grad students wind up working 80 hours a week. Because you've got 40 hours a week of your project, and then 20 hours a week at, of classes or grading if you're a TAing, um, and then another 20 hours a week of writing grants and helping out the group in other ways, and it gets really, really tiring. Um, and I'm exhausted just thinking about it now. I'm not as young as I once was. Um, let's go ahead and take our break, and uh, we'll go ahead and let's come back at five after, and we'll review SN1E1, S2, SN2E2 a little bit and uh, go from there. I know you're gonna look up that uh, quote. Do you mind if I ask you a quick question? No, not at all. It's not, that uh, quote's not uh, important anyway. <laughs> Do you mind if I share my screen real quick? I just had a question about some of the data in the uh, article that I'm doing. Yeah, let me, I think I have to. All right, go for it. All right. So I'm a little bit confused about the way that they're describing the binding affinities. I know this is like a concentration. I don't totally understand what they're using to the 
I don't really understand how to interpret that specific like labeling or whatever. So when you publish a paper, you, you have to have units on all, on all your numbers basically. Um, so, it, but it's capital K, um, which tells us it's an equilibrium constant. And so a lot of times if it's a specific type of equilibrium constant, um, then, then you can look like if you look up, you know, binding affinity and just Google it and get a Wikipedia page on binding affinity, it's, it's going to be like a lot like Ka, where, you know, for Ka we had was for a specific reaction, HA plus water in equilibrium with H3O plus and A minus, right? Every time you see Ka, you know it's for this reaction, regardless of what A is, what, what your acid is, you know that it's going to be Oh, that's the acid dissociating in water to make H3O plus in the conjugate base. So binding affinities probably have a similar reaction. And the units that are going along with that are probably going to are likely going to be based on, on what that cancels out, what the units cancel out to be in the equilibrium constant. So okay. like, because our equilibrium constant here would be. H3O plus concentration times conjugate base concentration over concentration of the protonated form, right? Yeah. And if you look at the units, well, it's concentration times concentration divided by concentration, that's going to cancel out to molarity as your unit. But that doesn't mean that the equilibrium constant is a concentration, just that the units cancel out to give you a concentration. Okay. Because I think that's the results that they're trying to display here, basically concentrations, like how, you know, in in terms of like potency, like how much do you have to administer to get? And then the same thing for the functional activity is, you know, same similar kind of EC values or whatever. I think it's similar with concentration type stuff. So EC50. So the sub 50 makes me think it's like an LD 50, where this is gonna be some value where 50% of it is bound. This is the concentration where 50% of your, your yes. antagonist is bound to the enzyme or something like that. Yeah, the complex or whatever, yeah. Um, so, so this, the EC 50 likely actually is a concentration. When you get to this concentration of, of the drug, then 50% of it is bound and 50% of it is free. So it's a little bit like PKA almost. PKA okay. is the pH where half of it is protonated and half is deprotonated. Right. Um, the EC50 is probably something similar to that, where it's a concentration where you, half of it's in one form and half's in the other. But you would you would want to double check that because um, I'm just making a taking an educated guess there. Yeah, and I've, I've been, like you said, Wikipediaing it and stuff like that and trying to wrap my head around it, but Matt's not really my strong point, but I think conceptually I can explain kind of the principles of what's going on, just not real specifically with the mathematical stuff. Yeah, it looks like, so I just, EC50, in biochem, we would have described that different. I'm looking at it's half of the maximal effective concentration. So it's the concentration where it's re the concentration required to re obtain a 50% effect. Yeah, because the so, efficacy kind of tops out. So that's halfway to your maximum efficacy or whatever. Right, and if you remember when we talked about kinetics in biochem, which I know was a long time ago now for you, we had that, we had an equation um, that we- The Menin test, Michael Menin test thing, yeah. Yeah, Michaelis Menin. Um, equation like that that. Had, uh, K, km was one of the variables in there and km was the concentration where half of the enzyme is or where your it was the concentration where your rate was half of the maximum possible rate yeah those are pretty intricate formulas yeah a lot of step-by-step -step stuff the, it was but at the same time what you know understanding okay well 
regardless of the form of the equation, I know KM is just this value, this concentration where I get half of our maximum rate. EC50 is very similar, except it's not catalyzing a reaction in this case, because you get the maximum, you get effect is based on how much of it is bound, right? For these, for these neurotransmitters, it's not based on catalyzing a reaction. Yeah, and I, I think I can understand like conceptually what they're doing with like the tritium bound LSD comp competitive binding assay. You can explain that pretty well. And I can explain like the calcium uh, luminescence flux assay or whatever. It's okay. just the specific like mathematics of the results. Like I can kind of conceptually explain this is what they were doing. This is, you know, the, the data that they got, you know, is supporting this kind of result from their test or whatever right yeah and, and that's and that's exactly what you should be doing just be um you know be able to explain those you know what are those variables like you're doing right now you're double checking that that's that's exactly what you're you're looking for cool man also there's another weird vocabulary thing I don't really understand. They said some rats are trained to discriminate against certain compounds. I'm not really sure how to interpret that. Well, that's so now we're getting into um, that not even just uh, neuroscience. That's almost more like like psychology, um, because we're not only are we dealing with a living organism, we're dealing with training a living organism. Um, and so it can be, you know, it, I don't know exactly what the, what the methods are, and I would leave that to the biologists and the neurologists that are actually doing these trainings, but it could be something like, um, you know, certain compounds, mice are, every time they touch that compound, they're given a shock. Um, there's some there's some negative stimulus associated with one molecule and a or a positive stimulus associated with the other molecule um and so they they just are using some sort of pavlovian mechanism to to train these mice um and it's like training somebody to differentiate between smell yeah and i think oh, you're freezing up a little bit Awesome. Let's give your give your internet a sec to, to catch up there. Oh, there you uh, are. Um, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying that the they're using the mice for the head twitch response. So if they're tr the mice are trained to discriminate against certain compounds, I would interpret that to mean it does not induce the head twitch response, regardless of whether or not it's an intoxicating compound. They've been trained to not twitch or something like that, maybe. Possibly, um, the usually something like head twitch response. I, I don't, I don't know enough to say for certain. So and this is where, where you're coming into the area where you're the expert now, as far as our OCHEM class goes. <laughs> um, so you might, you know, try to use the article to if that's if that understanding makes sense with the text of the article and like the conclusions that the article is drawn. Then I'd say that that's that's probably correct. It, it um, almost seems like irrelevant information. They're saying that these mouse are trained to discriminate some compound that they're not even using in the test. Then, then it's probably just background information. If they're not using that data anywhere, or maybe they're using that as a screening. Um, uh, yeah, that like, could be. Okay, we decided what compounds we were going to look at by using the results of this head twitch test from these mice that were trained to ignore, they're trained to ignore dopamine antagonists and preferentially select serotonin antagonists or something. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, there's just a couple loose ends I haven't really tied up, but I think I got most of them pretty good. Cool, then you're Thanks, on man. the right track. Yeah, I appreciate it. Let me go grab some more coffee. Go for it. Hey, Sean. Yeah. Um, I needed some similar help with my paper, understanding a couple different things with it, but I was planning on dropping into office hours. Does that work for you? Um, I, 
you're presenting on Thursday? Yeah, but you have office hours today, I believe. I don't on Tuesdays usually because, oh, but Tuesday, we, Tuesday, Monday. Yeah. but there's, there will probably be either a little bit of time after lab today, after everybody's presentations or tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. Or if you hang around for a few minutes, I can send you the link to um, my Gen Chem lab section, which is usually pretty dead. And once I get them started on working on their practice tests, we can duck into a breakout room and talk about it. Yeah, either one, either, any of those work well for me. All right, I'll send, I'll send you, so why don't you send me an email after class so I don't forget, and I'll yeah. reply with the, with the meeting invite and say like 1030, um, 1030. Okay. show up and, uh, and, and we'll talk about it then. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Sean. No problem. Sean, I have some similar questions, uh, just about some of the lab stuff. Um, and I was wondering, should I be or try to be a part of the, the drop group or would you be available tomorrow afternoon or even later today? Um, so today, today is going to be pretty slim because I um, just from all my my other classes and labs and stuff um, and everybody who's doing their presentations today. Um, but tomorrow I have time tomorrow afternoon. Um, I think I have office hours scheduled from two thirty to four, but I'm pretty open actually. If you if you can't make it from between two thirty and four, okay, I think that should work. Okay, let's right. let's just do that then. All right, great. And for those of you who are wondering, it was in fact a Sherlock Holmes quote. It was not. Um not from the BBC series. That's probably where I heard it last. Um, just from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It was a quote from one of the old actual novels from the 1800s. Um, and it's, let's get all these inspirational looking wallpapers. When you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable must be the truth. And so, good words to live by for interpreting spectra. It's all about eliminating possibilities. All right, so let's recap um, where we left off talking about substitution and elimination. Um, in the two ways we have of differentiating between our, we have four mechanisms at this point, right? Um, we had SN2, E2, SN1, and E1. And so the, the simplest way to differentiate these is by looking at what the products are. If it's, is it a substitution product or elimination product? But what's a little bit more um, telling about the mechanism itself and what products you will make is to look at, is it first order or second order? Right, remember second order means everything is happening all at once. It means you need everything to run into each other all at once. First order meant your leaving group leaves and you get, and you have a carbocation left behind. Right? And so the if we wanna look at the alkyl halide, a lot of times the alkyl halide itself will tell us, is it gonna go first order or second order? Right? Because second order can only happen if you have access to the active carbon or a beta carbon, right? You Second order is really not going to happen very much if you have a tertiary alkyl halide. Right, because a tertiary alkyl halide means that you've got a, um, a bromide or a good leaving group attached to a carbon that has a bunch of steric hindrances around that carbon. So you can tell whether it'll be first order or second order, partly based on the alkyl halide itself. Is it primary, secondary, tertiary? Right, and that's where that figure came into play if I look at the
um, the review section at the end of chapter seven had this figure in it here. So, and this is basically looking at the, ter the left hand axis here is saying, okay, primary, secondary, tertiary, where is your alkyl halide? If it's tertiary, you're never going to see SN2. If it's secondary, you've got sort of a sliding scale. You just see a little bit of SN2. It's still probably going to be mostly E2. Um, unless you're in a polar protic solvent and have, or have a weak base and a weak nucleophile, in which case you'd be over here in this region where we just say, well, it's basically going to not happen very well. Um, we can make it happen a little bit if we're over in this region, but it's going to be pretty uncommon. It's going to be pretty slow. And if it's primary, we're going to never see that carbocation. That carbocation is never going to happen. We're going to see no, no first order reactions. Right? So that's going to allow us to eliminate a lot of, of possibilities right off the bat. Like just by looking at what's your alkyl halide. Um, if we're in one of those, if it's secondary and we're trying to distinguish between is it going to go substitution or elimination, um, or how do we favor first order? Because we can still get those secondary ones to go first order if we have the right conditions. Um, and the way we do that is by favoring the we can favor the first order reactions if we slow down the second order reactions. If we have that polar protic solvent. If we have a polar protic solvent, that's gonna favor first order reaction because that protic solvent is gonna slow down the, the nucleophile's attack. It's gonna turn your, your strong nucleophile into a weaker nucleophile and your weak base into an even weaker base. Um, if we're in a non-polar solvent or in a protic solvent, that's almost always going to favor second order because your, your nucleophiles are going to be stronger. So strong base, strong nucleophile favors second order. High concentrations, especially high concentrations of your nucleophile favors second order because you're more likely to have things run into each other. And then the last piece, how do we differentiate between second order or between elimination and substitution? Well, one of the options, one of the ways to differentiate is, is it tertiary? If it's tertiary and all the conditions favor second order, then you know it's going to be elimination because you can't have SN2 happen on a tertiary uh, alkyl halide. Thank you. Close the door. Um, if it's secondary and you have a strong base and a strong nucleophile, you're really going to have some competition between the E2 and the SN2. And that's where adding heat can kind of slide this one way or the other. If you do this at very low temperatures, you might expect it to be um, SN2 because the entropy piece is not playing as significant a role. All right, so remember there, the other side is remember, we have this delta G equation, which is de dependent on temperature. At high temperature, you favor the mechanism that makes a more random product or more molecules is even better. In elimination, we actually get more molecules because we're taking we're taking our starting molecule and breaking it up into pieces for the elimination to happen. So if we want to favor elimination, that's always going to happen at high temperatures. Close the door. Here they come.
I my my four year old Valence is has uh, is missing Thanksgiving break already because at nine o'clock, all three of her housemates are all on Zooms at the same time, and she has nothing to do, and nobody has any time for her. All of a sudden, and last week we were all together the entire week. Um, all right. If we want to favor the substitution product, if we're in one of those one of those boxes where we have competition happening, so if we're in this box here, if it's a tertiary alkyl halide with a weak base and a weak nucleophile, we might expect it to be roughly 50-50 substitution versus elimination. But if we do it at a high temperature, that slides the scale over so that we get more of the elimination product. If we do it at low temperatures, it slides the scale the other way. So we're going to get more of the substitution product, right? It's still going to be a, a competition. You're still going to get a mixture of both of those possibilities, but we can favor one versus the other by controlling the temperature. All right, so let's do a practice. Let's draw the products of the reaction and say which will be more prevalent um, under each of these conditions. And when it says polar and and nonpolar, the more the more accurate way of saying that, and I, I need to update this, um, would be protic and aprotic. So And really, I should probably have specified a stereoisomer here as well, since our reactant is So pretend that that's a wedge that you could actually tell what's going on. All right, so what are we looking at if we look at the right hand case?
We've got a weak elimination. elimination. At the very least, we can narrow it down to first order. Because if we're in, we have a weak base that's also a weak nucleophile in a protic solvent. And remember that that, that diagram from WVU is probably a better resource, is more detailed than that, than the um, one from Klein. So we're in secondary, we're in the middle row here, secondary carbocation, E1, SN1. We don't have a strong nucleophile, so it's not going to be SN2. We don't have a strong base, so it's not going to be E2. So that means we're deciding between these two cases. In both cases, we have, we have a weak nucleophile and a weak base, so really we're going to get about a 50-50 mixture. Um, if I, if you wanted to try and specify between elimination or substitution, if it's not, if the temperature is not given, if it doesn't say at high temperature, or if it doesn't have that delta symbol for, for heat is added, you can assume that we are considering that to be low temperatures. Room temperature is generally considered to be a low temperature which means we're going to favor predominantly SN1. So in our SN1 reaction, the intermediate would look like try that again. Leaving group leaves. That's supposed to be a plus sign, not a T. Um, no rearrangement is going to happen, right? Because there's no no way we could make this a tertiary carbocation. So if it's going to go through an SN1, then the next step would just be our nucleophile comes in and attaches. So, and then we're going to wind up with a quick proton transfer after that to get to deprotonate that because our, our intermediate, our second intermediate then would look like Would look like that oxygen with three bonds so it's got a positive charge and then we would never leave it like that though something is going to be able to accept that extra proton because we're in a protic solvent so and if you don't know what it is you can just write and you need to write the generally speaking if i need you to show the mechanism, I will tell you what the base would be or what the solvent is. I wouldn't leave it general like this. But if it just says draw the products, you don't need to draw the mechanism. But just in the interest of making this make sense, the base grabs the proton. The proton's electrons stick with the oxygen. So our final product is going to be this intermediate, just minus the H plus. So cleaning that up. Would look something like that. Kitty. I've never met a cat with such an 
fascination with pens and markers. She's literally trying to pull my wife's pens out of her pen folder on her desk so that she can bat them onto the floor. They're put away right now. She's trying to pull them out. I mean, every cat has something like that, right? That's what makes them cats. Um, all right, so are we gonna favor R or S in this case? Or are we gonna get a mixture of the two? Are we going to get into stereoisomer at all? And that carbon that had the bromine on it still has four unique things attached to it, right? So we're definitely still going to get a stereo center. And going through this, this carbocation intermediate means that despite the fact it started with the bromine sticking out towards us, once the bromine leaves, we get this totally flat intermediate here. If our intermediate's totally flat, that means that our nucleophile could have come from on top or on bottom. One of one of those attacks would give you the R, the other one would give you the S. And they're going to be about equally likely. Um, there's, if you really wanted to split hairs about it, it's still going to favor backside attack just barely, but by like maybe one or 2%. It might be like 51% to 49%. And that's mostly just because um, even after your leaving group leaves, it still takes those nuclei that are left a second to flatten out because those nuclei are kind of slow moving, right? Because they're bigger. And so it kind of holds that somewhat tetrahedral position for a little tiny bit. Um, and it, so it, but it's, it's for all intents and purposes, we're going to say it's equally likely. So we could just write it as mixture of R and S. Just for the sake of of uh, practicing here, let's say that this was done at high temperatures. If it's high temperatures, we're still going to have the same we're still going to have the same intermediate because we're still in a protic solvent, which means we're still favoring the first order reaction. High temperatures just tells us that instead of making substitution product, we make the elimination product, which gives us, which means we have a few possible products that we could make. We could make the primary alkene. We could make the secondary alkene. No way to make a tertiary or a tri-substituted alkene. But do we have to worry about stereoisomers? Or is it for both of them or just one? Just the bottom one. Just the bottom one, right? So we could also have, and I, to have that molecule as well.
So now out of these options, which one's favored? So the, the die substituted is favored. So it's definitely gonna be one of the bottom two is gonna be the major product. And the one that puts them on opposite sides from each other, sterically is gonna be favored with two methyls in the um, E or the trans configuration, that's gonna be favored. So one, two, three. All right. Look. Wait, so um, I'm sorry. If we were given this question on an exam, would you want the SN1 that we just did or would you want the, the SN1? Okay. Okay. So if it if I if it's a case where it's going to be split between substitution and elimination, I'll try to differentiate between them. And I'll try to be explicit and either say low temperature or high temperature, but the other way it's drawn, it's up, written is with a delta sign. If you see delta written as a catalyst, delta in chemistry means heat added. Um, so if you just see it written as delta, that means with heat. If it's with heat, we would expect to see the elimination. Without heat, Um, or if it says low temperatures, we would expect to see the substitution. How about low temperatures with strong base in an aprotic solvent? Can you get a second order substitution maybe? Second order, this is a strong nucleophile and a strong base. So we, we're gonna see some combination. I believe our, oh, she managed to get one. Um, I believe our textbook has that listed as, it's gonna favor E2 if it's a strong base and a strong nucleophile. If it's a weak base and a strong nucleophile, then we get all substitution. So, but if we look, um, we're using methoxide is our nucleophile, right? So strong base, strong nucleophile, which means we get this combination, which generally favors elimination at room temperature. If we wanted to favor substitution, we would need it to say at low temperature. But again, I'm gonna try to be explicit and say, at high temperature, at low temperature. Um, so if we wanted to, to assume that this is low temperature, we'd get SN2, which means our mechanism would just look like That methoxide comes in backside attack, bromine leaves. So our product would wind up being that molecule, where we've got a a, an ether attached that oxygen is attached where the bromine was, but we get the opposite stereoisomer. If 
if we said it was happening with heat, the bromine is still going to leave, but instead of attacking that carbon, we're going to wind up with our methoxide pulling off one of the hydrogens next door, pulling off a hydrogen from a beta carbon. So our elimination products would wind up being the same elimination products actually as before. If it's pulling off a hydrogen from that lower CH2, I guess I'm, I'm just confused how we would get that first um, alkene. So let's, you're right. It's let's further color code. If it pulls off from the other beta carbon, then you get the, the product that's in green. But you see how the, they're both beta carbons, right? Mm -hmm. So if it pulls off from the blue beta carbon, you get the bottom two products. If it pulls off from the green beta carbon, you get the top elimination product. And just to clarify. Without heat, we would expect just the substitution or predominantly substitution. With heat, we get the elimination products. John, I have a question about that. Yeah. Um, so I understand that why heat favors elimination, but I thought that if it was secondary with a strong base, strong nuke, it kind of favored elimination anyway. So like what, at what point do you say like, so room temperature would be low temperature. So are you saying that at room temperature, a secondary would favor SN2 or would it, is it kind of like, where does that level lie? There, it's a sliding scale, right? And so that really, that's hard to make a really quality or a really definitive call on because it depends on just how strong is your strong base. The stronger your strong base, the more it favors the elimination. Um, if it's kind of a strong base, but not that strong of a base, then it'll favor the substitution. So it's, it's there's a lot of qualitative stuff in there that depends on the exact situation. So in terms of trying to come up with an ex a real rule we can follow, um, that's why I'm just sort of trying to, to specify, OK, with heat, assume elimination. Without heat, or if I say even better would be if I said at low temperatures, if we did this on ice, um, then we can assume substitution. At room temperature, it's really going to be a mixture of both, probably favoring the elimination, like you said. I'm, I'm just trying to put it into context that allows you guys to make, you know, a rule in your head for understanding this and, and make a, defi a definitive call. And so that's, that's what we're going to arbitrarily somewhat say is our dividing line is if I say with heat, think elimination. If I say at low temperatures on ice without heat, you can assume substitution. Um, just just for simplifying things right i got you i i can understand there's so many different variables and it's kind of sliding so that's a good one yeah it's it's just really hard and that's why the the two the two cheat sheets don't even really agree with each other here clear yeah right like the this one says no uh sn1 e1 at all on two and the other one says it does happen 
Yeah, right. Exactly. And this one says that that it favors elimination with strong base, strong nucleophile, but you get some SN2. But the other one says that it's going to depend more on, um, you just say it favored with heat. SN2 is favored with a strong nucleophile. And it, it doesn't say that I, I kind of favor this way of thinking about it assume substitution unless it says with heat um realistically at room temperature we'd wind up with a big mess of products and that's why we have gcs to sort them out um so and and if we really wanted to do a synthesis where we were trying to favor the substitution really strongly and maximize our yields we would do something like do it um on on an ice bath or if we if we have a solvent that won't freeze um you can actually do it at negative 70 celsius which is the um the melt or the sublimation point of dry ice you can actually make a dry ice bath with dry ice and acetone because acetone's freezing point is below negative 70 celsius so you could actually do this at a really low temperature not quite what we'd call cryogenic but pretty close um by dropping this all the way down to negative 70 and then we really favor the substitution um room temperature is sort of that that point where it becomes you know um 50 50 really or at least close to where you have an appreciable amount of both mechanisms yeah i'm starting to really see that there the uh was it murphy's law like the way it really does apply here and that it's kind of everything but there's certain you know ways you can push it or or not right it's all about it's all about tipping points how do i get it to slide one way versus the other right all right Thanks. <clears throat> now we're down to only eight minutes left um but i'm at least going to present synthesis which when we only have four mechanisms synthesis is not super tricky but it's a different way of thinking that compared to what we've been doing um what we've been doing is predicting okay if this is where i'm if these are my reactants trying to predict the products synthesis is doing the opposite synthesis is saying i want to make this molecule what do i start with um and again it can feel like there's so many possibilities you don't even know where to start um the main thing is to just pick one that satisfies your constraints a lot of times there's going to be some other constraint like starting from you know molecules that have no more than six carbons or starting from this molecule how do i get to this product if it's going to be a multi-step synthesis but if it if it's just something like okay i want to know that how do i get from if I want to make this product, where do I start? If I'm if I'm starting from here, what steps could I do to allow us to go back and forth? Um, and this slide is actually we haven't covered addition reactions yet, um, and so we will talk about how we know that you could add a bromine to each side of an alkene. That's going to be the first chapter we cover next quarter. Um, I just wanted to cover the what the con basic concepts of synthesis were, and that is you're trying to go from a certain starting material, or a, sometimes you're given a starting material and you need to figure out what are the steps along the way. And sometimes, and in that way, it's almost a little bit like a mechanism. How do I start here and get to there? Um, and sometimes it's a matter of, okay, if this is the product I wanna make, what do i need you actually have to come up with your starting material like, okay well if i could if i had chlorocyclohexane i could get to dibromocyclohexane um and so this is from chapter seven this is sort of a summary it seems like we've only done four mechanisms so this seems like we shouldn't have something this complicated um but there are a lot of different bases and nucleophiles that we could use, right? That would give us different products if we went through substitution versus elimination. Um, you know, we've done examples where we use cyanide as our nucleophile, we've, and that would give us what's called a nitrile if it went through a substitution reaction. Um, 
if you w wanted to turn an alkyl halide into an alcohol, we would use OH as our nucleophile because hydroxide then would replace it. And so we actually have a lot of tools um, when it comes to figuring out what, what different functional groups we could make. It's gonna be a matter of picking your alkyl halide properly and picking what your nucleophile is, right? So it's, it's the other two pieces of the puzzle. It's I give you the product, you tell me what the starting materials are. Um, and same with the with elimination reactions um, and uh, tertiary carb or alkyl halides. Um, we're going to wind up with some, of, if we favor the elimination, we can get the Zaitsev product or the Hoffman product. If we don't favor elimination, we're going to get a, sub, a substitution product. But it's always going to go SN1 if it's tertiary. Right, so there's a lot of variables that we we have in there to consider um, when it when it comes to how do we pick which um, which of these reaction conditions is ideal. Um, and again, that is ignore that last one. Um, so starting with an alkyl halide of your choice. So we have to start with some alkyl halide. How do we get to this molecule? This is our desired product. And if, go ahead, Cody. I was just thinking about what the starting product would be. Wouldn't it be the same molecule with the bromine attached instead of a cyanide? That if you can pick your alkyl halide, that'd be the, the easiest choice is, is if you can look at this and, and recognize, okay, there's my nucleophile. I'm going to use cyanide is going to be my nucleophile. If I want to make this CN group attached, well, that's my nucleophile. And then that means that whatever leaving group I have has to be attached in the same place. Um, and we do need to pay attention to stereochemistry if it's relevant. It's not here because we wind up with an al a primary alkyl halide. But if we can, if it just says of your choice, alkyl halides are really convenient because they go through substitution reactions really easily, right? So if when it says do, it sounds really intimidating to do a retrosynthetic analysis. Um, that just means, all of that means is that you're gonna show um, what you're starting from. And so you see, um, when you see arrows that are that are drawn, like this, that means that you're reacting backwards. That's that's a retrosynthetic arrow. And so it's just saying, okay, if I want to get to the cyano group attached, I could start from a bromine attached. That's all retrosynthetic analysis is. So it's really simple in this case. You just draw your reaction arrows as that, that two line arrow, that sort of hollow reaction arrow. And that is all, not even always drawn. If we, if we wanted to show the synthesis, we would start with the molecule that we wanted to start with, the alkyl halide of our choice. And we just say, and it says showing all necessary reagents. So then it, it's saying, okay, what do we add to that alkyl halide that's gonna get us to the desired product? So we need to use cyanide as our nucleophile. So sodium cyanide is our reactant or just cyanide, CN with a negative charge. And then if we wanted to favor this, we don't want elimination to happen. 
because we want the substitution product. We don't want a first order reaction. We don't really need to worry about that because it's primary. But if, um, if we wanted to make sure that we had as little elimination as possible, we could say we wanted to do this at low temp. would be a way of differentiating, say, okay, to favor substitution, we wanna make sure that this doesn't get too hot. Because a lot of times these will be exothermic reactions, right? And so as your reaction happens, you're gonna wind up with your temperature rising, which means you're gonna get, start getting more and more impurity. But then again, if we make the reaction too cold, the reaction slows down to the point where everything stops, your reaction rates all drop. So it's a fine line and ice bath, keeping it in ice bath, at, or keeping it at room temperature by gradual or you know occasionally dunking it in an ice bath are are all ways that in lab we could actually do this. But if we're just trying to come up with what's the synthesis, this is the synthesis right here. Start from this alkyl halide, add sodium cyanide to it, try to keep it from getting too hot. That's your synthesis. We actually wanted to write it out as a procedure. We need to get a little bit more specific, like add this many grams or milliliters of these different reagents, put it in this type of glassware, that kind of stuff. Um, but as far as just writing a synthesis, this is good. Right? And it's as easy as that if it says just starting with an alkyl halide of your choice. We're going to add more and more reactions to your toolbox, and they're going to start getting to be more and more steps. like. Okay, you don't get to start with an alkyl halide. You have to start with just bromine or what butane. I mean, starting from butane, how can you get to this molecule? Well, you have to find a way to add a methyl group, and then you have to find a way to add a bromine, and then you have to find a way to substitute the bromine. Right. So, but you don't have all those tools yet. So, for right now, synthesis is just write out the alkyl halide you want, including stereochemistry if you have to. Add your nucleophile, specify solvent, specify temperature. Right. So I wanted to show you guys that so that you've seen it. Um, because there will probably be, be one question like this on the test. It'll probably be about this level. It's not going to be super in-depth multiple step synthesis because you guys don't just don't have the tools yet. We'll get there. All right, and now we've completed your last lecture for OCHEM 1. Good work, everyone.